So uh, significant improvement, uh, increase in tonnage, a slight improvement in grade, and uh, virtually 99% conversion from inferred to indicated resources. So right now we're sitting at 495 million tons of 0.37 copper equivalent. Welcome to those tuning in to the Assay TV where today I'm delighted to be joined by Robert Wares, the President and CEO of Osisco Metals. Welcome, Robert. Great to have you. Yes, very happy to be here. So for those that are a bit more unfamiliar of Osisco Metals, can you just give us a little recap of the company? Uh, yes, we're a base metals exploration development company focused on uh, two projects in Canada, our favorite uh, jurisdiction in the world. It's in our backyard as well. Uh, the Pine Point Project in Northwest Territories and the Gas Bay Copper Project uh, located in uh, eastern Quebec. Let's jump into the Gas Bay Copper Project, shall we? Um, yeah, we've had some absolutely. exciting news releases there, an updated MRE, I believe. Can you get into some of the numbers for us? Uh, yes, our updated MRE follows up on the 22 uh, MRE. So uh, significant improvement, uh, increase in tonnage. A slight improvement in grade and uh, virtually 99% conversion from inferred to indicated resources. So right now we're sitting at 495 million tons of 0.37 copper equivalent. Uh, that translates to 0.3 copper, 0.016 molly and a bit of silver for a resource, uh, in-pit resource of about 3.2 billion pounds of copper or 1.47 million tons. Uh, so that was a very significant improvement. Uh, strip ratio is very reasonable at 1.2. And uh, that was all based on a 0.15% uh, copper cutoff. Excellent. And just last month as well, you also released some impressive metallurgical results, um, recoveries of 90% average copper grade. Can you go into that for us? Did you anticipate that? Yeah, um, Absolutely. Yeah, so that was the result of work on uh, 18 samples within the Copper Mountain uh, mineralized body. Uh, we're dealing with both copper and molybdenum uh, mineralization. It was important to us to establish uh, whether or not we could potentially recover the molybdenum. Uh, the way it works is when you float uh, your copper sulfides, the molybdenum follows. And then usually you have to regrind uh, the copper concentrate and separate out the molybdenum in the secondary step. That's fairly standard. If you don't take out the molybdenum, it ends up as a penalty in the copper concentrate. So not only do you not get paid for it, you actually get penalized. So it was important for us to be able to extract uh, the molybdenum. And we were successful. Uh, we ended up an overall molybdenum recovery of 65% on the 92-94 copper recovery. And... Um, we're looking at about uh, concentrate, uh, copper concentrate grade of about 20, 26% copper. And for our molybdenum, it'll be close to uh, 59% with very little copper left in the moly concentrate. So both are uh, commercially uh, viable products. And uh, to date, we do not think we'll have any penalties, but uh, we're actually working on a press release as I speak. Uh, to announce the trace element uh, results uh, indicating that uh, they're all quite low. So both are going to be very good quality concentrates. Excellent. What are the next steps there for that project now we've received these results? Next steps, uh, more metallurgy. Uh, metallurgists always want more samples, more testing. This will be sufficient. Uh, this level of uh, sampling and testing will be sufficient for the upcoming PEA. Uh, which we uh, hope to release in uh, Q1 2025, after which we'll go directly to feasibility based on the presumed positive results from the PEA. It's it's a bit of a super PEA to the extent that we did a lot of trade-off uh, studies. Uh, and so for the feasibility, we'll need more sampling, more testing, and this uh, we will execute this summer. Uh, we'll take larger samples. We'll be drilling PQ core, which is quite wide. That'll allow us to do uh, three things. Um, do, do geotechnical measurements uh, along the projected pit walls in the PQ drilling. 
uh, have sufficient mass to do drop weight tests for eventual uh, mill design. And thirdly, uh, give uh, produce a lot of sample material. This not this will not be assayed uh, for the resource. It'll simply be devoted one hundred percent to metallurgical work. So that'll provide us ample material and uh, hundreds of kilograms to do uh, further testing on both copper and moly. Excellent. Let's move on to your Pine Point project. Um, do we have an update there? What's what's happening at that project? Uh, yeah, we've uh, we're about to launch a feasibility at Pine Point. Uh, permitting process is going fine, so uh, we're uh, we respect to our original plan and our joint venture with Appian. Uh, we're maybe four months behind schedule. Hopefully, we can catch up. But uh, we're still uh, we're essentially uh, still shooting for. Uh, FID to reach FID by 2027. And so, uh, yeah, we're pretty much uh, on budget on time. And the uh, project is going very well. Um, we're about to release the uh, MRE actually on point to point, the updated MRE for the feasibility, uh, well, I would say within the next two or three weeks. So you've been quite busy. Um, so oh, back yeah. to Canada, you said it was your favorite jurisdiction in the world. Why is that? Can you tell us what it's like operating there? And obviously, they offer some incentives for miners. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, it's not so much a financial aspect. Uh, it's more jurisdictional. Uh, there is essentially very little jurisdictional risk in Canada. Uh, permitting complexity varies from province to territory, but overall it's it's still manageable. And uh, what we're seeing on around the world, of course, both on the permitting and jurisdictional side is increasing uh, difficulties. Um, that's basically my philosophy is I'd rather have a tier two base metal asset in a tier one jurisdiction than a tier one asset in a jurisdiction that I'll never get permitted. So um, it's something to consider. A permitting risk has essentially become the number one risk worldwide in terms of mining development. Uh, you, especially for a junior developer, you cannot afford to be on a 10, 15 year schedule for permitting. It's just, uh, it's just not acceptable. And in terms of right now of uh, maximizing the value of an asset, uh, that translates essentially to a permitted asset. So uh, on that note, Canada is, uh, well, actually Fraser Institute just came up with this latest survey and obviously uh, Canada, many of the provinces in Canada are ranked in the top 10 in the world. I'm sure. So we're quite comfortable uh, working here. Excellent. And just looking at copper generally, obviously it's having quite the moment um, in terms of pricing. Do mm -hmm. you see a great market outlook for 2025? Do you see any shortages looming? How do you see that outlook? Um, well, the copper supply side has been an issue now for uh, at least a year and it's getting worse. Uh, the uh, shortages have been predicted by groups such as S&P Global and, and Woodmac, and, and now it's becoming a reality. And I think uh, it's going to be a serious problem, uh, especially if you include demand being created by global decarbonization. Uh, we're headed for a very significant global copper shortage. I, I think it's only starting. But even if you increase the price of copper eight bucks a pound or you know fifteen thousand dollars a ton, it's not going to help because to bring new copper mines online or expand current uh, mines still takes time. Uh, you know the shortest permitting process in the world right now is is probably four years. Uh, Brazil is is better than Canada. Or you're still talking several years. So best thing you can do in Canada generally is five years. So uh, increasing copper price uh, is going to help. Hopefully it'll bring back more institutional interest uh, in copper projects and development projects. But it's not going to solve uh, what I consider to be a, a looming crisis on the supply side. Certainly a good time to be a copper miner, though, um, in the midst of these looming supply crises. Um, right, just to wrap up our interview, can you highlight some milestones for our investors just to summarize what they can be looking out for in the next few months? Uh, next few months, well, again, very busy year, both at Pine Point and uh, Gas Bay Copper. Uh, we just, uh, we're just starting the 2024 drill program at Gas Bay Copper. Uh, there'll be two phases this year, one focused on uh, drilling the higher grade core of the Copper Mountain deposit uh, for an eventual uh, starter pit. Uh, 
basically we're going to cherry pick that deposit in the early years uh, in order to bring in higher grade material up front into the mining sequence. And that's going to require more drilling in the core of the deposit. Uh, I also want to do more drilling, convert some of that into measured category rather than uh, indicated. And we're starting exploratory drilling just to the south. It's called Needle Mountain. Uh, it's another small previous producer within the Gas Bay Copper Complex. And that's uh, there hasn't been a whole Needle Mountain since the 70s. And uh, we're trying to establish whether uh, we, there's open pitable material at higher grade in the, in that uh, area as well. Uh, drilling is going to, last phase of drilling is going to be executed at point point uh, this summer uh, before uh, we basically shut down the exploration development drill program and uh, move on to feasibility with uh, our updated MRE. So uh, yeah, busy year and uh, we're strong believers in both uh, copper and zinc. We're riding out of both, and we're very bullish. So uh, I think it's going to be very exciting for the company and the investors. Well, certainly sounds like a busy few months for our Cisco Metals. And we thank you for spending some time with us today. Okay, thank you very much.